I'm going to try to preach today. Deuteronomy 1 verse 21. Behold the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. And then here's the command. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Fear not and neither be discouraged. Go down just to verse 35. Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb, the son of Jephthah. He shall see it, and to him I will give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, this is Moses speaking, thou also shalt not go thither, verse 38, but Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in Thither. Look at the next two words. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit. I'm going to try to preach today very quickly. I, last week I was 34 minutes preaching. I'm going to try to set a new record today. I want to preach on this subject, defeating the giant of discouragement. Defeating the giant of discouragement. If you just lay your Bibles down, I know we've been praying a lot today, but if you just lift your hands one more time towards heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, we worship you, we magnify you, God, for you are so good, you are so powerful. God, you are so worthy of praise, you are so worthy of all the honor, of all the glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, you are so mighty. I exalt you, O oh God. I exalt you, O oh God. I praise you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Can we give the praise team just a good hand today? Thank you guys for doing just a great job. And I know we were, were down a little bit on, on some faces that we, you may be seated, that we normally see, but they did just a great job today, and I'm very thankful. Numbers chapter 13 gives us the account into Moses sending the 12 spies to search the land of Canaan. If you're unfamiliar with uh, the scripture reference, maybe you could maybe do a little homework this afternoon or just read through it at some point this week. I will reference just a few verses today. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. In verse 7, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what land it is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. In other words, Moses was saying, I'm sending you into a place that has already been given to us. Amen. That's what the Bible said in, in, in 13 and verse 2. He said, the Bible said, he said, go search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. So there's 12 tribes in Israel. Moses takes a representative of each of those tribes. He sends them into the land. He said, I want you to, he said, I, I don't want to just go into this blindly. He said, I want you to find your way into the land. I want you to look around, see if it's good land, bad land, see what the people that are there, what they look like, what are they dwelling in, are they, are they strong? He said, but I also want you to remember that there is some fruit in that land as well. And, and I want you to bring some of that fruit back to us so that it will be an encouragement or an inspiration to us that do not see it firsthand. And down in verse 26 of Numbers 13, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought word back unto them and all of the congregation, listen to me, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land which thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. 
But then there's always somebody that's going to follow, follow what we see up by something negative. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. But Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. Caleb was one of the 12 spies that went up. We can read on down into scripture after Caleb stilled the people and said let us go up at once and possess it. He said for we are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome this land. But the men but the men that was with him said, We be not able to go up to these people for they are stronger than we. And then they began to plead their cause and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying, The land which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak which came of the giants, which come of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so we were in their sight. Deuteronomy chapter 1 that we just read Moses is reminding the people of what God could have done if they would have had the right mindset, the right attitude and the right spirit. The children of Israel have come out of the bondage of Egypt. God had a plan for his people to take them from bondage in to a land of freedom. That land was Canaan land. It was their promised land. They, it, 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 it's called promised land for a reason. This is, if I promise you something, there is a well intention that what I am saying that you are going to have. So Canaan land was their promised land. It was the plan of God for them to leave the bondage of Egypt and move into a land that flowed with blessing. Brother Mark mentioned it this morning. Over 430 years God's people had been held captive. It was the intention of God to liberate them, to set them free from the Egyptian captivity into a land of freedom. Twelve men, twelve men sent into the land. Twelve men seen the fruit of the land. Twelve men seen the possibility of the future. But only two of the twelve believed that it was for them. When they asked, what did you see? They responded, you are exactly right. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. Matter of fact, here is, here is some of the, 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 uh, the uh, evidence of the fruit. We, we brought it back and the scripture says they carried it. They carried the fruit of the land. I'm not, I'm not talking about just some little bitty strawberry that somebody found over in the corner. I mean something that uh, when they grabbed a hold of the grapes there, it was the size of that Leslie right there. They, they said, yeah, we want you to know what we've seen is true. There is fruit there. It, it is a blessed land. It flows with milk and honey. But, but, but I want you to know there's also people there. There are giants there. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled. And on top of that, the, the sons and the children of Anak, every place we looked, every direction we looked, there was an obstacle in the way. And Caleb steps up. He silences the crowd. He said, come on, let us go up at once and possess this land for we are well able, but the men, this is what is so disturbing. The men that were with him had a completely different response than what he had. Have you ever left a church service before and you run into two different people and one person says, oh my God, you should have been in church today. There was such a liberty in the presence of the Lord. There was such a freedom in the presence of the Lord. I mean to tell you, we lifted up our hands and it's like the glory of the Lord fell down upon us. And then 30 minutes later, you can get a call from somebody else. Did you? Can you believe that that church service went like that? Can you believe how many people people were missing today. Did you hear how sour that note was? Come on, two people can be in the same building but have different... 
reflections on what God is doing. I'm here to tell somebody today, there is a land that flows with milk and honey and the fruit is great thereof, but there's also some giants in the land, but we are well able to possess the land. We are well able to take what God has already promised for us. Yeah, you're right, man. Look at this fruit. Look at this. It's amazing there. It's blessing there. But I also want you to know there's walls there, that there's big giant men that are there, and they are stronger than us. They, they look so big and so bad. They look like they could just flip us with the end of their finger and our life would be over. The fact is this, is there is always going to be giants that stand in the way of the blessing. There are always going to be walls that are separating you from the fruit of the land. But what they were missing out on is God had told them up front, this is already your promised land. You're just failing to realize that all you got to do is walk into it. Come on, the victory is already there. The healing is already there. The deliverance is already there. Don't get sidetracked. Come on, if all you see is obstacles, you'll never see the opportunities. If all you see is obstacles, you'll always live a defeated life. If all you see is the sickness and the problem and the trials and the tribulations, you'll never walk in joy. You'll never walk in peace. But if you can get your eyes off of the giants and get your eye on the fruit, I'm telling you there is a blessing that God has for your life. Hallelujah. I know that there's some that are looking around at your circumstances this morning. There's no way we can do this. There's no way this is ever going to work out. We are going to lose big time this time. Hey Amen. I'm preaching to somebody in this house. There's no way that God's going to heal them of that. There's no way we'll ever see every seat filled. There's no way we'll ever recover what we have lost. There is no way we'll ever knock the walls out of this building. There's no way that we'll have multiple vans running on a Sunday morning. There's no way, my God have mercy, that must be for somebody else. No, I'm telling you right now, if all you see is what we can't do, then we'll never walk in what we can do. I'm challenging us to open our eyes to see past the mess of right now, to look past the giants of right now and just change your perspective for just a few moments. Yes, there are giants and yes, there are walls, but there is also a promise. There is also a promise as well. Maybe if you would stand up and lift up your hands, you would see things a little bit different. Maybe it mo Maybe if you'd get out of your seat every once in a while and say, God, change my perspective. Yeah. Hear me for a few minutes. If all you ever look for is the bad stuff, then guess what? That's all you ever going to see. And I know people just like that. You could give them a gold wedge and they'd gripe about the color. I've known people, I've seen people, I've been around people. They could walk up on the most lush, beautiful, amazing place and the only thing they're going to see is a little speck that's on the wall over there. They ain't going to see the beauty of the building. I know people that go to church. They don't see the beauty of the church. All they're looking for is the problems of the church. Well, can you believe that they're sitting there? Can you believe they acted like that? Can you believe they responded that way? You never see the beauty of the church. All you see is the... My God, have mercy. Let me tell somebody right now, if you walk into St. Thomas West today, I'm sure somewhere in that building, there's gonna be something that's not up to par, but there's also healing there. There's deliverance there. There's encouragement there. There's strength there. If all you're looking for is a giant, then that's all you'll ever see. But I believe that God is about to deliver us from the land of the giants. Hallelujah. If you need to move to get a better view, do it. If you need to separate you from your pew mates, do it. 
Matter of fact, it'd probably do some of you good to sit on the front rows. That way you wouldn't be able to sit behind everybody wondering what they did wrong this week. My God, have mercy. I feel like doing something in this house right now. I feel like God wants to change somebody. God wants to turn somebody around. Come on, Pastor. My God. Now I know why you sit right here. Because you don't see nobody behind you. Oh, let me just tell you, Brother Mark. Let me just tell you. If you only knew what some of them back there thought about you. My God, no wonder you sit on the front row. If My God, have mercy. If you'd get up on the front and say, God, I'm not interested in what's going on in the rest of the building. There's fruit here. There's joy here. My Lord, if all you ever speak is negativity, guess what? Negativity is going to flow into your life. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And the latter part of that verse says you will eat the fruit thereof. So whatever you go speak out, baby, that's what you go eat later. So if all you're speaking out is mess and gossiping and complaining and griping and how big the giants are and how thick the walls are, then guess what, baby? You're always going to be surrounded by walls and giants. But if you'll get your eyes on the fruit, if you'll get your eyes on the milk and the honey, my God, guess what? I know that there are times that things get bad, really bad. I know that. I know that there are some giants in the land, but there's also some fruit there. I know that there are walled cities there. I don't have my head stuck in the sand this morning. I don't have my head stuck in the sand this morning and say, well, everything's everything's hunky-dory and everything's lollipops and gumdrops. I know that's not. I've dealt with stuff this week that's a mess. I've had conversations this week that I wished I never had to have. So I'm not saying that there's no giants in the land. I'm not saying that there's no sickness. I'm not saying that there's no trouble. But if all you see is the trouble, you'll never see the promise. You'll never see the fruit. Come on. We need to be delivered from the giants of discouragement. Hallelujah. Last week, last week, uh, I'm not a huge Gatlinburg fan. Brother Jamie, would you grab me a bottle of water, please? I'm not a huge Gatlinburg fan, to be honest with you. I think it's beautiful and all that. And I do love rednecks. (laughs) And I do love Smokey the Bear and Fudge and uh, all that. And uh, so we kind of got our calendars a little sidetracked and we went to celebrate Sister Victoria's mother's 60th birthday for a couple of days. And, and when we agreed to it, I don't know, seven, eight weeks ago, I wasn't looking at my calendar. I just said, yeah, we, we'll do that. I didn't realize that it was my spring break. Well, old Nate likes to go to the beach <laughs> on the spring break. I'd much rather look at the waves and clear waters than rednecks. <laughs> Four-wheel drive trucks with Donald Trump signs. God bless them. So I found my way up into Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge. And I had a good time. There's no place in America that can steal your money faster than Pigeon Forge. I mean, to tell you what, a man standing at you with a gun to your head can't steal more money than Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. So we, we got up into Gatlinburg, and I there's a place called Anakista up there. And uh, my cousin... I can't even I can't say that because some of y'all try to get the deal too. I can't tell it. I'm not gonna put her in that situation. So there's a place called Anakista. When you go up into Gatlinburg, I would highly recommend it. It's absolutely fantastic. But the line is terrible. The line is long. You're standing out there, the sun's beating down on you. And you're just like, oh my goodness, this is ever gonna end. We have the opportunity to ride up a sky lift up the side of the mountain, Brother Warner. You probably know what I'm talking about. You look like you'd like Gatlin Burke. <laughs> now, Sister Cherie looks like she likes, uh, you know, oh, shoot. I was going to say you was more of a 
Turks and Caicos gal. <laughs> I'm just picking up. So we stand in line for about 55 minutes just to get the tickets. So you have the option to ride the sky lift, which I'm all for. I love that. I had, we had 11 people with us, and, and the lady told us, said, if you'll go right over there, see so you can ride that truck up the side of the mountain, it'll be a lot faster. They're loading it right now. Well, little did she know that they had led all of Gatlinburg in that line too. So not only we stand in line for 55 minutes to get tickets, we stood in line another almost an hour before we got on that truck, and it took up, up, up to the side of the mountain. When you get off that truck and you walk out, the view is literally unbelievable. It's literally unbelievable. And as I stood up there, Mother, I began to think about uh, the song that uh, Sister Carol, Sister Brother Carol Magruder wrote called From Heaven's Point of View. And Sister Magruder sang it under such an anointing that if you will raise up yourself, if you will change your perspective, if you can just get up a little bit higher, things start to look a little bit different. My God, have mercy. If it felt good to get up that high, I wonder what would happen if I got up here. You see what happens sometimes is we get so caught up in where we are in the moment and we're saying, my God, everybody's going to hell in a handbasket. Everybody is despondent. Everybody's in despair. Everybody's dying. Everybody's in trouble. But if you would just change where you're at, if you would just change your position, if you would just get up a little bit higher, you say, Pastor, how do I do that? Start clapping those hands. Start lifting those hands. Start saying, thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Get out, dance a little bit. You'll be stunned. Sister Quindo, nothing in Gatlinburg changed. I changed my position. Gatlinburg was still it. They were still selling fudge and candy apples. They were still down there walking around with three teeth in their head. But I changed my perspective. I got to a place that I could see things different. If all you see is rumbling around in the mully grubs, then the mully grubs is all you ever get. But if you'll get up a little bit, if you'll rise up a little bit, you can see things differently. A giraffe and a turtle can stand on the same piece of ground, but they have different perspectives. How is it that you can set five feet away from somebody that's dancing and shouting and rejoicing and magnifying God, and you're sitting over like this? I don't. I can't wait till this service is over. I wish he'd just shut his mouth. I'm sick of hearing. How is it that two people can be in the same building and one be saying, "My God, the joy of the Lord is my strength," and somebody said, "I don't know if I'm going to survive." I'm going to tell you what. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Lift up your. Come on, change your position. You'd be surprised at what a few minutes of prayer a day would do to change your week. You'd be surprised at what just a few moments in the Holy Ghost can change the outlook on life. Why do you think the devil tries to keep you down all the time? Amen. He knows if they understand what happens when they make an effort to get close to Jesus. They will see past the giants of despair. They will see past the giants of sickness and defeat. If they ever get their eyes up, if they ever shut off the noise of the negative voices, Caleb still the people, said, be quiet. That's a Bible word for shut up. <laughs> I'm not recommending that today. But it probably wouldn't hurt for some of you to look at your circle and say, I've had just enough of your negativity. I've had some of you living in houses with negativity. You work with people, all they do is speak negative all the time. Come on. You may have to look around and say, hey, I've had enough of your voice. I've had enough of your influence. I choose to praise the Lord. I choose to worship the Lord. I choose to tear down the giant of discouragement. Matter of fact, I was reminded of a great song this morning. I believe Keith Whitley sang this song a long time ago. You say it best when you say nothing at all. That would be a very nice way of I've had enough. 
Listen, you get on Apple iTunes. You download. You say it best. Send them the version that has that sweet little, what's the little? Yeah, Allison Krause. Send that version. That sweet little voice, she could make, she make the devil praise God, I think. That sweet little boy, download that baby down onto your phone. And if you click up in the top right corner, it gives you options to share this song. Hit the share button and then put it in your text message to the one that keeps running their jaw, the one that keeps telling you you can't overcome, the one that tells you you're never going to be healed, the one that tells you that child's never going to come back, the one that tells you that the church ain't going to grow, the one that tells, my God, have mercy. Come on, you just need to shut some voices down. Hallelujah, that intimidating voice that will haunt you in the midnight hour. I'm praying for some Joshua and Caleb's right now. I'm preaching to some Joshua and Caleb's in the room right now that you believe we can take this city. I'm preaching to some Joshua and Caleb's for the next five minutes that you believe we can overcome, that you believe we can see 200 souls at new life. I'm preaching to the Joshua's and the Caleb's right now that you see the potential of revival right here in front of us. I feel this in the Holy Ghost right now, but I have a vision for something bigger. Brother Mark, I don't see a full house right now, but that doesn't mean that I can't see it in my spirit. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, I don't see the parking lot full yet, but I see it in my spirit. I may not physically be able to see it, but I see it in the spirit realm. I'm looking past the giants. I'm looking past the walls. I see the fruit that God is wanting to pour out. Brother... Brother Wilson is driving in the parking lot right now. A 2024. A 2024. 15 passenger van. The kind that you can stand up in and move around. Amen. I just see it in the Holy Ghost. We're going to have three or four or five of those. And every single Sunday, we're going to be bringing people to the house of God. Now, oh my God, have mercy. I see something in the spirit realm right now. I see blinded eyes being opened. I see in deaf ears being unlocked. I see addictions being broken. I see the supernatural. I look past the giants. I see the fruit of the land. In the name of Jesus, let it be so. In the name of Jesus, let us get a vision for a bigger day, a better day, a more productive day. Jesus, Jesus, I wish you just connect with somebody for about 30 seconds that believes. Come on, just connect with somebody for about 30 seconds. God, I believe. God, I believe the giants of discouragement are coming down. I believe the walled cities are coming down. I believe depression is going to leave my mind. I believe fear is going to leave my mind. Hey, Shandai. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, I know the devil's fighting with despair and discouragement, but we're tearing down the giant of discouragement today. We're pushing back against the spirits of darkness right now.
I've come with a word of encouragement for those that are battling discouragement. The devil don't want me to say it right now, but we're going to defeat that giant of discouragement. We're going to defeat, we're going to defeat that giant of despair in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You can stay standing, sit down, whatever you want to do. I'll be done here in just a second. I come in here last Sunday morning, and uh, I mentioned it a little bit last week. I, I'm an early riser anyways, but not at 3 a.m. And I woke at 3 o'clock in the morning, and my spirit was troubled. My spirit was troubled. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's just the spirit's troubled. I got up out of the bed. I went upstairs and sat in my chair, and uh, I said, well, it ain't going to do me no good to sit here and and be like this. I said, I'm going to just get up and go ahead and get ready and come over to church. So I, I don't know, it's 5 or 5.30, something like that when I got here at the church. And I got right down here, right there in that corner of that altar. And I said, God, you got to show me something. I said, God, you got to show me something. I, I don't know what I'm, what's going on. I'm not comfortable with being troubled. Hey, Amen. I'm not comfortable with... Knowing something's wrong and not doing something about it. And uh, I got down there and prayed. And I don't want you to take anything that I'm saying in the wrong way. And if you do, that's on you, not me. You know my heart and my spirit. The enemy knows. The enemy knows. Now, I'm not trying to set myself up for failure. So please understand what I'm saying. I say this with a humble heart. The enemy knows more than likely he's not going to get me with a bottle or pills the enemy knows more than likely he's not going to drag me into an illicit relationship with someone that's not my wife. I'm not setting myself up for failure right now. I'm just being honest with you. I said, the enemy kind of knows that, hey, he, he's 51 years old. He got his mind set. He's he going to make it to heaven. But I'll tell you something. I said, Lord, you got to speak to me and show me what this is. And the Lord spoke to me just as clear as I'm standing right here right now. He said, the enemy has sent a spirit of discouragement. What does this, I'm not talking about, listen to me, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about a discouragement to quit. I'm talking about a discouragement to give up on a better day. Uh, just a spirit of discouragement. Well, why does it matter trying? You, you continue to see empty seats. You, you continue to hear excuses. Why, why keep preaching? I'm preaching this message right now so that I'll put the devil in his place. I don't care if next week I'm preaching to nobody. I'm still believing that God is going to tear down, that God is going to raise up. There is fruit in the land. There is promise to be possessed. So you know what I've done this week? I begin to pray against the spirit of discouragement. I said, devil, you think you're coming to me with something that's going to cause me to give up. But I'm going to tell you, I accept the challenge. I'm, my God, help mercy. You think I worship before? You ain't seen nothing yet. You think we dance now? You ain't seen nothing yet. But I'm not the only one. There's some of you in this room right now that you are being pressed with a spirit of discouragement. You are being pushed into the ground with a spirit of discouragement. We have come to defeat the giant of discouragement in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm closing, Brother Jamie, if you'll help me. I got a couple of more things I want to say and I'll be done. David stands up in 1 Samuel 17. We all know the story. Goliath. He's defying the people of God with what? His voice of intimidation. Goliath was getting back the normal response from everybody that he spoke to. Everybody was afraid of what he was saying. Amen. Everybody was afraid of Goliath because he was a giant. And nobody could see themselves defeating a giant. Now, if it's something that's on equal playing field, then I may have a chance. When it's somebody that kind of looks like me, sounds like me, kind of lines up with me, then I may have a chance. I think Brother Hardy could probably whoop me, but I would say I think I'd give him a little bit of a fight. 
He laughing at that. He knows I'd take you down, boy, in just a minute. But when, I, when I'm looking at somebody that's about, you know, I'm kind of looking out, I, you know, I'm kind of sizing him up, I think there's a chance. I think there's a chance that I may be able to do a little something. But when you look across the aisle and there's a giant, nine foot, nine inches tall or more, they said the armor on the upper part of him weighed over 150 pounds. His sword by itself was between 15 and 20 pounds just by itself. I mean, he had a coat of mail on. He looked bad. Just a bad dude. You know what the word Goliath means? The name Goliath? Look it up, all you Bible studiers. The word Goliath means splendor. Look at that enemy. Wow. And some of us get so intoxicated by looking, just simply looking at the giants in our life. Because Goliath, to be honest with you, as far as a fighting machine, it was splendor. My God, look at that coat of mail. Look at that sword. Look at that shield. Look at that javelin. Listen to that voice. And that's all he was doing to defy the armies of God was simply speaking to them. There's a little boy come running along that he did not like what was being said. He didn't care what the enemy looked like. He said, I don't like what that enemy's saying. I don't care how big and bad he is, he's saying the wrong thing. He went through a little process. His brothers, the ones closest to him, said, what are you doing down here? You, you acting like a fool. Come on, man, you need to go back to the house and take care of your father's sheep. So his brothers rejected him. Those closest to him. Then his leadership, Saul, who was a head and shoulders taller than any man. David did not kill his giant. He killed Saul's giant. Don't make somebody else kill your giant. That giant was standing up and he was defying the children of Israel, but the king was Saul, not David. David was a little shepherd boy. But when God saw that the king, the one that should have been killing giants, wasn't doing a very good job, he said, let me find this little bitty thing over here that everybody says is crazy and you, you can't do this. Everybody tried to talk him out of it. David said, let me tell you something. He said, you should have seen me. He said, when a lion and a bear come after some of my father's sheep. He said, surely God will do to him David wasn't concerned about the size of that giant he wasn't concerned about how deep his voice was how big the sword was how big the shield was David wasn't worried about any of that this is what David said then said David to the Philistine thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield but I come to you in the name of the Lord now listen, I don't want to dive off in this because I'd aggravate some of you because I wouldn't have enough time to preach it. But it is easy to identify the weapons of the enemy. Well, you're coming to me with depression. You're coming at me with fear. You're coming at me with lust. You're coming at me with pride. And you want to speak back what you can do. Well, I can go to I can go to AAA or whatever it is. I go to AA. I can go meet that counselor. I can take a pill. I can drink a little alcohol. You come to me with depression. I've got a pill. I'm not trying, I don't want to aggravate anybody right there. You're coming at me with a, you're coming at me with all these weapons. But but Goliath, I want you to know I'm not coming to you with anything that I'm gonna name except the name of the Lord. You come at me with your shield, you come at me with your fear, you come at me with your sickness, you come at me with your depression. I come back in the name of Jesus. I come back. I come back in the Holy Ghost. I come back in worship. I come back in praise. Lord, have mercy. Listen to this. You hear me? The devil uses the art of intimidation. 
just as Goliath did. Goliath was so intimidating with his voice and he was so used to nobody coming towards him. He never dreamed, Brother Jerry, in a million years because the Bible says that David started running towards him. David started running towards him and what he had in his hand, Brother Warner, he had just a little slingshot, something maybe look a little bit something like that. Little slingshot, what do you mean? What do you mean a giant standing over there on the other side that's got javelins and swords and shields? Matter of fact, Goliath had his own little fighter that went in front of him. He got all this stuff and you've got that in your hand. God is letting you know if you'll just use what's in your hand. You don't have to try to go use something else. You don't have to try to go get something fancy. You don't have to go spend a bunch of money and go to this class or go to that class. Find a prayer room and say, God, I'm not leaving here until I am endued with power. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. It doesn't matter if it's a fast song, a slow song, doesn't matter if it's half empty, it doesn't matter. God, I'm going to lift up a praise. I'm going to lift up a prayer. And you start running towards your enemy. That giant is coming down. Man, I lied about my preaching long today. Goliath was so used to his voice doing the job, Brother Wilson, that he never pulled his sword out he walketh about seeking whom he may devour as a roaring lion you say well how do I know he didn't take his, his sword out because the Bible tells us the Bible says David let that rock go in that slingshot and it smoked Goliath to the ground but David did, David wouldn't go settle for just knocking his giant down David said if I've got him on the ground what I got him here I'm going to kill this sucker how am I going to do that I'm going to cut his old ugly head off and the Bible said that David went and stood upon Goliath and he pulled Goliath's sword out of its sheath so that lets me know Goliath didn't even think anything of it. He thought, my voice will do the work. My voice, if I intimidate them, that, that, that they'll, they'll run back to the house. But what he doesn't know is we're running to the house of God with prayer. We're running with unity. We're running with praise. We're running with expectation. We believe that this giant of discouragement is coming down. He stood upon Goliath. He used Goliath's own sword. Come on, you ought to use what the enemy's trying to use against you back on him. He used Goliath's own sword. Now that's a bad deal when you get killed with your own gun. It's a bad deal when Satan comes at us with all kinds of smiths and we just turn that around on him and said, devil, if you think you're going to get me with that, let me tell you what. You think I'm a liar? You're a liar. You think I'm going to hell? You are going to hell. You think that I'm defeated? You ain't seen nobody defeated like you, devil. You may speak that mess to me. Hey, man, if you'll step out of your seats, if you want to come to the front for just a moment. The giants of discouragement are going down in Jesus' name.